Hello and welcome to this Disclosure and Borrowing Service information session. This is a pre-recorded session facilitated by me, Rebecca Bull, DBS Regional Outreach Advisor for Yorkshire and the Humber. If you have any questions about any of the content in this session, please feel free to get in touch using the contact details at the end of the presentation slides. This pre-recorded session will cover the items on screen. Who we are here at DBS and what it is we do. We'll look at what regulated activities are and how they are defined. We're also going to explore why it's important to make referrals to DBS when it's appropriate and who is responsible for making those referrals to DBS when there is a safeguarding concern. And following on from that, we'll also explore the DBS borrowing functions in more detail. Again, if there's anything you wanted to know which isn't covered in this pre-recorded session, please get in touch with us at DBS and we're more than happy to talk anything through. But first, let's have some introductions. The main purpose of the Disclosure and Barring Service is to protect the public. We do this by helping employers make safer recruitment and employment decisions and by barring individuals who pose a risk to vulnerable groups. We hope to fulfil our vision by being a visible, trusted and influential organisation, providing an outstanding quality of service to all our customers and partners. Our people understand the important safeguarding contributions they make and of course feel proud to work here. We all want to work together to make recruitment and employment safer. This is one of the reasons why the DBS Partnerships Outreach Team, we work with organisations of all sizes and from all sectors across the country and why we are delivering information sessions like this today. The Outreach Programme was introduced in our current five year strategy, which details our ambitions for 2025 and focuses on three key elements, our profile, our people and quality. The strategy details a number of actions that DBS aimed to deliver by 2025 and for which the Midpoint Refresh was published in June 2023. Our work here at DBS, it provides significant protection to the public and the delivery of this strategy will enable us to develop as an organisation, improve the services we provide and support the contribution we make within the safeguarding community. The Disclosure and Barring Service, also known as DBS, it was established on the 1st of September 2012 through the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012, when the Criminal Records Bureau, or CRB as it was known, and the Independent Safeguarding Authority, or ISA, they merged. DBS is responsible for the delivery of disclosure and barring functions on behalf of the government. Now, what you see on screen here, this is the legislation that underpins everything we do. We have different pieces of legislation which govern our disclosure and barring functions, and we do understand it can get complex, but we have been working hard at DBS to try and support organisations in understanding this legislation and, of course, applying it. We've developed a number of leaflets and guides on checks and referrals to provide that guidance and help clarify some of the common misconceptions and all those resources can be found on the DBS website. DBS, we can only operate though because the law allows us to and those laws set out what we must do here at DBS and what we can do. We operate disclosure functions for England, Wales, Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. And that's done under part five of the Police Act 1997, supported by the Rehabilitation of Offenders Exceptions Order Act 1975, Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006 and the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012. We operate barring functions for England, Wales and Northern Ireland under the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006 the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Order 2007 relating to Northern Ireland and again the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012. For residents of Scotland, disclosure and barring functions are undertaken by Disclosure Scotland. Um, for residents of Northern Ireland, disclosure functions are undertaken by Access NI, but it's still DBS that undertake the barring functions in Northern Ireland. Now, whilst it's not DBS who undertake disclosure functions in Scotland and Northern Ireland, 
information from the Police National Computer System that covers the whole of the UK. Therefore, regardless of where you live and where you've obtained your certificate, the information will always be disclosed. Our most commonly known services and products here at DBS are, of course, our checks. A DBS check is a record of a person's criminal convictions and cautions, and we provide DBS checks for people living or working in England, Wales, the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. DBS checks are used by employers, organisations and recruiters of all kinds as part of their safer recruitment and suitability checks. DBS checks are part of a whole process for safer recruitment, along with references, checking someone's ID and history, the verification of qualifications and, of course, any risk assessments. DBS share that when recruiters get a DBS certificate with information on it, they conduct a case by case analysis of that information and decide if it's relevant to the role being recruited for. Also, it's highly important to be mindful that a DBS certificate with no information on it does not mean a green light from DBS to employ that person. A certificate with no information on it, it means just that. There's no disclosed information about that person. So recruiters still need to undertake other safer recruitment and suitability checking. Exploring then the four levels and types of DBS check that are available, we'll start with basic. A basic level DBS check. There is no eligibility criteria that needs to be met in order to access this level of check. Anyone can be asked to get a basic level DBS check and checks can be used for any role and purpose at this level. The basic level DBS check can also be obtained by the person themselves, by the DBS website, or via what's called a responsible organisation. Details of responsible organisations are all on the DBS website. Responsible organisations are those registered with DBS to submit those basic level DBS check applications. As you'll see here on this slide, a basic level DBS check will inform of unspent convictions and conditional cautions. Moving on to the next level of DBS check, we have the standard level DBS check. Now, a standard level DBS check that will inform you of spent and unspent convictions and cautions subject to filtering, which we'll pick up in the next slide. There is an eligibility criteria that needs to be met in order to access this level of information and that's set out in the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act Exceptions Order. Then moving on to the next level of DBS check, that is the Enhanced Level DBS check. An enhanced level DBS check will inform of spent and unspent convictions and cautions and also relevant police intelligence. Now, relevant police intelligence is non-conviction information that a chief police officer reasonably believes to be relevant to the workforce or role being applied for and that that information ought to be disclosed. Eligibility for enhanced level DBS check access is set out in the Police Act regulations. To further explore though that relevant police intelligence, I'd like to share a few examples of what that may look like. So examples of what the police can disclose under police intelligence include, but aren't limited to, incidents for which individuals were never ch charged, arrested or prosecuted. Incidents for which individuals were found not guilty in a court of law in certain circumstances. Information about incidents which were dealt with by other bodies other than the police, such as local authorities in their disciplinary processes, employers, schools, hospitals, etc. And relevant police intelligence can also include what's called third party information. So information about people other than the DBS check applicant. And then moving on, we have the enhanced level DBS check with a check of the DBS barred list or lists. So this is everything 
that you would find on an enhanced level DBS check so it will inform of spent and unspent convictions and cautions subject to filtering rules relevant police intelligence but also a check of one or both barred lists and again it's the police act regulations that set out when barred list information should be disclosed as just mentioned, for a basic level DBS check, there's no eligibility criteria that needs to be met to access that. So anyone can be asked to get a check and it can be used for any role and any purpose. And a basic level DBS check can be obtained by the person themselves or via that responsible organisation. But with standard enhanced and enhanced with barred list checks, these have to be obtained via a registered body, which is an organisation that is registered with DBS to submit those standard enhanced and enhanced with barred list DBS check applications. Some registered bodies also provide an umbrella service to employers who are not registered themselves, and they're known as umbrella bodies. And there's a full list of those that can be found on the DBS website. A question that we do sometimes get asked at DBS is what is the difference between spent and unspent? In a very broad sense, a spent conviction is a criminal offence that has completed the required rehabilitation period, whereas an unspent conviction is a criminal offence that is still within the rehabilitation period. Now, if you do need to know more information about rehabilitation periods, it's important to go to the gov.uk web pages for the most up to date and accurate information on that. Returning to the reference that you see here on screen, filtering. This is the term that DBS uses to describe the process that identifies which criminal records will be disclosed on standard, enhanced and enhanced with barred list certificates. There are certain minor or old offences that may not be disclosed on someone's DBS certificate. They're known as protected offences and we'll cover these more in our next slide. The filtering rules are set out in legislation and DBS we must issue certificates according to that legislation. Again, filtering is the term we use to describe the process that identifies which criminal records will be disclosed on standard or enhanced DBS certificates. Filtering applies to standard and enhanced certificates. It was first introduced in 2013 with a further update in 2020. Filtering rules that were updated on the 28th of November 2020 were that warnings, reprimands and youth cautions will no longer be automatically disclosed on a DBS certificate and something called the multiple conviction rule has been removed, meaning that if an individual has more than one conviction, regardless of offence type or time passed, each conviction will be considered against the remaining rules individually rather than all being automatically disclosed. So on the topic of convictions, again, all convictions are considered individually. A conviction will be filtered from a criminal record certificate only if 11 years have elapsed since the date of the conviction. That's five and a half years if under 18 when convicted. It did not result in a custodial or suspended sentence. And a criminal conviction will be filtered from a criminal record certificate only if it is not on the DBS list of specified offences that will never be filtered. Moving on to cautions, reprimands or final warnings. A caution for adults will be filtered after six years have elapsed since the date of the caution and only if it does not appear on the DBS list of specified offences that will never be filtered. Youth cautions are not disclosed on DBS certificates and childhood reprimands and warnings will not automatically be disclosed. The police still have the power though to disclose this information if it's relevant and ought to be disclosed. With reference to specified offences, a specified offence is one which is on the list of specified offences agreed by Parliament, which will always be disclosed on a standard or enhanced DBS certificate, regardless of how long ago it was given. Specified offences are usually of a serious violent or sexual nature. I'd like to spotlight now on the DBS update service. 
This is a really great complement to our DBS checks and certificates. Organisations and employers can check online free of charge with the individual's consent their DBS certificate. The certificate must be at the level that you're able to check and for the correct workforce. The update service is available to anyone who is applying for a standard or enhanced level DBS check. At this time, basic checks can't be registered with the update service. For an annual subscription fee of £13, or that's completely free for volunteers, an individual can take their certificate with them from role to role, if within the same workforce and where the same type and level of certificate is required. But more than one certificate can be included in that subscription. The update service is really valuable for employers and organisations who complete periodical rechecking of someone's DBS information as it saves time and money, um, but it's also part of an ongoing safeguarding practice. As a DBS certificate has no expiry date, um, it is important to be mindful that the information on a DBS certificate is as up to date as the date the certificate was issued. While someone is employed or volunteering with an organisation, the recruiter will not know about any new criminal records information unless the person tells them. They complete a new DBS application or they use this DBS update service to see if there is any new information they need to be aware of. The update service will check for updates against the police national computer information on a weekly basis, barred list information on a weekly basis and other intelligence every nine months. It's important to note that individuals must subscribe to the update service at the time they are applying for their DBS check or within 28 days of receiving their certificate. Before carrying out a status check, please ensure that you have seen the applicant's original certificate, that you've checked the applicant's ID to confirm their identity, and of course, that you have their consent to undertake this. Please make sure you're legally entitled to the same level of DBS certificate, standard or enhanced. And check, does that DBS certificate only contain the exact workforce that you're entitled to know about for the role that you're recruiting for? If any of that is a no, you might not be able to use the DBS update service. If you have got any further questions or you want to explore further the update service and how your organisation can embrace this, please let us know at the DBS. We're more than happy to guide you through the process and the use of the DBS update service. Spotlighting now on DBS workforces. The Police Act 1997 Criminal Records Regulations, they separate eligibility for enhanced level DBS checks into three categories. Work with children is the child workforce, work with adults is the adult workforce, and everything else falls in the other workforce category. When completing a DBS application form, the applicant will be asked for the workforce, so who they will be working with, children, adults, or both children and adults. Making sure you get the correct workforce selected and highlighted on the application form is really important for many reasons, including police intelligence reasons. Thinking back to the enhanced level DBS checks and police intelligence, the chief police officer can disclose non-conviction information if it ought to be disclosed and is relevant to the workforce. If the correct workforce is not understood and correctly chosen on that DBS application form, there is a risk of potentially important safeguarding information not being included in that DBS certificate. So if you know for certain that the role you are, the role you are recruiting for will only be working with those under the age of 18 years old, you would choose the child workforce. Similarly, if the role will only be working with those 18 and over, you would choose the adult workforce. But within many organisations, they will be services for both children and adults. And in these scenarios, you would choose both the child and adult workforce. The other workforce, this includes things like taxi licensing, security licensing, things that are associated with the Gambling Commission and other uh, gambling activities and also licenses to handle controlled drugs. 
For the purposes of this recorded session, we're going to focus on the child and adult workforce. But if you want to learn more about the other workforce, please get in touch with DBS and we're more than happy to explore this with you. Before we dive into the child workforce and then following on from that, the adult workforce, I'd like to explore the topic of regulated activities. What are regulated activities? Well, regulated activities are the activities that the Disclosure and Barring Service can bar people from doing. It's a criminal offence for a barred person to seek to engage or engage in activities from which they are barred. It's also a criminal offence for employers or, or voluntary organisations to knowingly allow a barred person to engage in regulated activities with the group they are barred from engaging with. The legislation around regulated activities, it helps provide a framework for when recruiters can request barred list information, but also assist DBS in our safeguarding functions by allowing DBS to bar people from certain roles with vulnerable groups and also make it unlawful for organisations to recruit someone who is barred into certain roles. Those roles that fall within the definition of a regulated activity role. We'll take a moment to spotlight on the children's workforce and then the adults workforce, of course, starting with children's. Now, for DBS purposes, a child is a person who has not yet reached the age of 18 years old. This table on screen will help you decide if an activity is regulated activity with children, the what, how often and when supervision has an effect. Those carrying out the activities on screen could apply for an enhanced level DBS check with children's barred list check if it meets the criteria for falling within that definition of being in regulated activity with children. Please remember that anyone placed on the children's barred list, it is illegal for them to engage in any activity that is a regulated activity with children and again unlawful for an organisation to allow someone to do that. Healthcare and personal care need only to be done once to be regulated activity. Other activities need to be done at a certain level of frequency to fall within that definition of regulated activity with children. The frequency criteria is more than three days in a period of 30 days or once overnight with opportunity for contact between 2am and 6am. Also, for some activities, if the person is supervised themselves by someone who holds an enhanced level DBS certificate with children's barred list check, their role may fall away from the definition of being a regulated activity role by the nature that they are supervised. They can still apply for an enhanced level DBS check, but without a check of the children's barred list. Now, there is further guidance available on supervision rules in respect of regulated activity, which can be found on the DBS website and, of course, can be talked through with a DBS regional outreach advisor. But working through our table here on screen, right at the top, we start with healthcare. So healthcare provided by a healthcare professional or someone acting under their direction or supervision, even if just done once, that's regulated activity with children. As is personal care. So personal care where help is provided with eating and drinking because a child is ill or has a disability, or where help is provided with toileting, washing and dressing because of a child's age, illness or disability, if just done once, that's regulated activity with children. Moving further down those roles and activities, teaching, training and instruction, caring or supervising. If the person carrying out one of these activities is unsupervised whilst carrying out that activity and it's being done often enough, that's regulated activity with children. Providing advice or guidance on physical, emotional or educational well-being. Again, if done often enough, that's regulated activity with children. Driving. If someone drives a vehicle that is being used for the purpose of conveying children, including anyone supervising or caring for those children, then they will be eligible for an enhanced 
level DBS check with a check of the children's barred list, as long as they're doing it often enough. However, it's important to note that that doesn't apply to applicants who are driving children as part of a private arrangement, such as arrangements between parents. Moderating a web-based service. So where a web-based service is set up wholly or mainly for children and the moderator has opportunity to access and modify content and to interact with those users, if that's done often enough, that will fall within the definition of regulated activity with children. There are a couple of regulated activity with children roles where the frequency criteria is not applicable. As you can see towards the bottom of our table here, such as registering to be a childminder and registering to be a foster carer. Also, those responsible for the day to day management of someone in regulated activity with children, they are also in regulated activity with children and can apply for that enhanced level DBS check with children's barred list information, even if they don't have contact with the children. There are different rules for those aged 16 and 17 who are in employment or a volunteer position. The teaching, training, instruction, caring for, supervising or providing advice or guidance, they are not regulated activity with children if provided in the course of employment or that volunteer placement. So a manager at a workplace supervising a 16 or 17 year old employee or volunteer, they would not fall within the definition of being in regulated activity with children. It's worth noting that where someone does an activity that would be considered regulated activity with children, but they don't do it often enough, they can still obtain an enhanced level DBS check but it would be without a check of the children's barred list information. As a real life example, uh, someone who teaches or trains a child, but only twice a month, they may still apply for an enhanced level check, but without that check of the children's barred list information, because they're not doing that role often enough to fall within that definition of being in regulated activity with children. Now to spotlight on specified establishments. If someone does not meet the criteria for what they do, it's really important to consider where that person is working. Specified establishments are places set out in the legislation because of their purpose in relation to children. Individuals working in these places may not be carrying out one of the activities listed on the previous slide, but must satisfy all the rules to be considered in regulated activity, as you can see from this slide. So if someone is not teaching, training and providing instruction, caring or supervision of children, for example, but they do work in a specified establishment as listed in box one of this slide, and they meet the criteria set out in box two of this slide, then actually they do fall within that definition of being in regulated activity with children and can access an enhanced level DBS check with a check of the children's barred list information. For example, a full-time school caretaker would be in regulated activity with children if they have opportunity for contact with the pupils, even though they don't work directly with them. Just to note that if a role working within a specified establishment is paid, then the individual will always be in regulated activity with children and eligible for that enhanced level check with children's barred list information. And that's regardless of the level of supervision that they are under. Now let's move on to the adult workforce. Um, for DBS purposes, an adult is a person who is aged 18 years and over. To spotlight on regulated activity with adults, as you'll see from this slide, the following activities only need to be done once to be within that definition of regulated activity with adults. Those roles that involve regulated activity with adults can access an enhanced level DBS check with a check of the adults barred list information. And anyone who is placed on the adults barred list, it is illegal for them to carry out 
any of the activities you see here on screen and illegal for an employer to employ or recruit as a volunteer someone barred to carry out any of these activities. Diving into the different activities that we see here on screen, we'll start with healthcare. Healthcare by or under the supervision of a healthcare professional, again, even if just done once, that's regulated activity with adults. Moving on to personal care. The definition of personal care for adults is different to the definition for children. It includes, due to age, illness or disability, reasons for giving support for eating, drinking, toileting, washing, dressing, oral care, care of skin, hair or nails for health reasons. Social work provided by a social care worker to an adult who is a client or potential client, that is regulated activity with adults as is assistance with the day-to-day -day financial running of the adult's own household, which incorporates managing cash, bills or undertaking shopping. Assistance with the conduct of an adult's affairs, so those appointed with power of attorney and deputies appointed under mental health orders. And conveying adults to from or between healthcare, personal care and or social work services who can't convey themselves because of their age, illness or disability. That is two regulated activity with adults. And very similar to uh, regulated activity with children, those responsible for the day-to-day -day management or supervision of anyone carrying out the on-screen activities they are two within the definition of being in regulated activity with adults and can apply for that enhanced level DBS check with adults barred list information. So our previous slide explored what falls within the definition of regulated activity with adults, but there will be some roles that involve working with adults aren't and don't fall within the definition of regulated activity. There is another category uh, and definition called work with adults. Now work with adults roles can apply for an enhanced level DBS check but without a barred, adults barred list information. There are three steps to follow to identify whether the position you are recruiting for is carrying out activities which are within the definition of work with adults and can apply for that enhanced level DBS check. Step one, the adult must be 18 or over and receiving a listed health or social care service or receiving a listed activity set out in the legislation. The full lists are available on the DBS website, but as an example, those listed health or social care services are things like someone living in residential accommodation for care or nursing, those living in sheltered housing, people who need support, care assistance to develop capacity to live independently, those being provided with care or assistance because of age, illness or disability in the place where they live. And some of those listed activities set out in legislation, they are anyone detained in prison, remand centre, removal centre, those on probation, those who receive a direct payment, advocacy services or have a power of attorney. Step two. The employee or volunteer, as the case may be, they must do one or more of the activities bullet pointed here. Teach, train, instruct, provide assistance, advice or guidance, care for, supervise, provide treatment or therapy. That includes CBT and counselling. Moderate a public interactive electronic communication service. It may be that they work or they're volunteering in a care home or that they're driving adults under contract arrangements. That's different to conveying adults, driving adults under contract arrangements. It's a third party or formal arrangement, so something being done uh, on behalf of an organisation, but it doesn't have to be for health or social care reasons. It can also be for day trips, shopping trips, things like that. And step three, it's being done often enough. So more than three days in any period of 30 days, 
or any time between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. Or it could be that the person is undertaking any of those activities once a week on an ongoing basis. If all those three steps apply, that role falls within the definition of work with adults and can apply for an enhanced level DBS check. Now, a common question we get asked at DBS is what level of DBS check a trustee of a charity may be able to apply for. Trustees of children's charities or adults charities, as per the definition on this slide, they can apply for an enhanced level DBS check. However, a trustee of a charity, they may also carry out other roles for that charity. Before they are appointed or if that role changes, what we do advise is organisations should assess any other responsibilities against the eligibility criteria to see whether the activities being done fall under the definition of regulated activity with children or adults. That will then allow uh, them to, that will then allow sorry, an organisation to ask the trustee to apply for an enhanced level DBS check in the child workforce with a check of the children's barred list information or an enhanced level DBS check in the adult workforce with a check of the adult's barred list information. Now, if the trustee is also in regulated activity, both roles should be made clear in the position applied for field on the DBS check application form. Looking now at the barring functions here at DBS. DBS is responsible for maintaining the adults and children's barred lists. These lists include individuals that are barred from engaging in regulated activity, whether that be via employment or volunteering. People can be placed on one or both barred lists and when placed on a barred list, the, position, the person is on there for life. There is no expiry date to being on a barred list and a person will only be removed from a barred list if they have successfully appealed a barring decision or had a successful review request. Looking at where DBS get the referrals from, there are three routes to this. Now, a referral is information about a person and it tells DBS of concerns that an individual may have harmed a child or vulnerable adult or put a child or vulnerable adult at risk of harm. DBS can only consider a person for inclusion in a barred list where the person is or has been or might in future be working with vulnerable groups, including children, in regulated activity. There is one exception to this, and that is in respect of auto bar referrals, as you can see detailed here on this slide in the middle column. But starting with our first column and the first referral route, we'll start with discretionary referrals. Now, discretionary referrals is when someone contacts the DBS because they have concerns that an individual may have harmed a child or vulnerable adult or put a child or vulnerable adult at risk of harm. These referrals can come from employers, agencies, keepers of registers and supervisory authorities. <coughs> Next, we have the auto bar referral route. This is where someone is convicted of or cautioned for an automatic inclusion offence. These are serious offences already set out in law, which require DBS to bar the individual from regulated activity in the relevant workforce. If it is an auto bar without representations referral, the person is placed straight on the barred list without any right to an appeal. If it is an auto bar with representations referral, then the person being barred is allowed to comment on why they feel they shouldn't be placed on the barred list. Then we have the disclosure referral information route. This is when information comes to light because an individual has applied for an enhanced level DBS check with one or both barred list information. Because the individual is looking to work in regulated activities, 
if the police national computer identifies particular information, that application will automatically go to our barring team for consideration as to whether the individual should be considered to be barred. Now you'll see on this slide there is also reference to representations. Now, as part of the barring decision making process, the referred person can make representations to give their views and evidence. There is no legal need to make representations from the referred person, but representations are an important part of making fair, consistent and thorough barring decisions and are an opportunity for the referred person to explain why they feel it would be inappropriate or disproportionate for the DBS to include them in one or both barred lists. When someone is placed on the barred list, there is an appeals process that they can undertake if they wish. It needs to be on a point of law or error in fact. And also when someone is placed on the barred list, after a certain period of time has passed, they can ask DBS for a review of that. As you can see at the bottom here in the dark purple where it says request review, if they were under 18 years old when placed on the barred list, after one year they can ask for a review. Between the ages of 18 and 24 when placed on the barred list, it, after five years they can ask for a review. And if they were 25 years and over, it's 10 years before they can ask for a review. Or they can bring that forward, but there needs to have been a material change. I'd like to explore with you as well the power to refer. The power to refer to DBS happens when an organisation is not acting as a regulated activity provider, but it's usually uh, when the organisation is undertaking their safeguarding role. The power to refer can be used when an organisation thinks a person has either harmed or poses a risk of harm to a child or vulnerable adult, has satisfied the harm test or has received a caution or conviction for a relevant offence. The person they're referring is, has or might in future be working in regulated activity and the DBS may consider it appropriate for the person to be added to a barred list. So who has the legal power to refer? Under the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006 and Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Order 2007, the organisations that have the power to refer are local authorities, keepers of registers and supervisory authorities. Some scenarios in respect of the power to refer could include uh, following a child protection investigation, a local authority finds that a parent has harmed a child. The local authority is also aware that the parent is employed by a private daycare nursery. Or an adult social care investigation identified that a member of staff working at a privately run care home carried out emotional and physical abuse of the elderly residents. The member of staff left during the investigation, but the social care investigation concluded that if that member of staff had not left, the care home would have dismissed them from their role anyway. If you ever need more information or guidance on the power to refer, please contact DBS and we'll be very happy to guide you through that process. Sometimes there is a legal duty to refer a staff member or volunteer to the DBS. Even if the legal duty to refer someone doesn't apply, you can, if you think it's in the interest of safeguarding, always make a referral to DBS. Again, even in the absence of the legal duty to, because we are obliged legally to consider all an information from any source. But sometimes there will be a scenario or situation where you must by law refer someone to DBS and the responsibility to do that sits with the regulated activity provider or personnel supplier. Now the duty to refer applies even when a report has been made to another body such as a local authority safeguarding team and the duty to refer applies irrespective of whether another body has made a referral to the DBS in relation to the same person. 
A person who is under a duty to refer and fails to refer to DBS without reasonable justification, you're actually committing an offence and if convicted, could be subject to a fine of up to £5,000. So when does the legal duty to refer someone apply? You must refer someone to DBS when two conditions have been met. Condition one is you withdraw permission for a person to engage in regulated activity with children and or vulnerable adults. That could be via dismissal. It could be that the person was redeployed, so moved to another role or area of work that wasn't regulated activity. It may be that the person took retirement or was made redundant. Or it might be that they resigned, especially if when confronted with the allegation, the employee or volunteer, they resign from their position before any disciplinary action takes place. What we do say in scenarios where someone has resigned, been made redundant, took retirement, or it may be that they just abandoned their post, is still important for organisations, even in the absence of that person, to follow through with all their disciplinary and investigation processes and procedures. And if at the end of that, they decided that even if the person hadn't gone, they would have removed them permanently from their organisation, then you need to make that referral to DBS. Condition two, you think the person has carried out one of the following. Engaged in relevant conduct, satisfied the harm test, or received a caution or a conviction for a relevant offence. Now we explore relevant conduct and the harm test deeper in the next few slides. But to recap, relevant offences, this is where someone is convicted of or cautioned for an automatic inclusion offence. These are serious offences already set out in law which require DBS to bar the individual from regulated activity in the relevant workforce. It's important to note and remember as well that the burden of proof to be met by the prosecution's evidence in a criminal prosecution is beyond reasonable doubt. However, the standard of proof used by the Disclosure and Barring Service is the civil standard of proof, so balance of probabilities. So it's more likely than not that that or something has happened. Further exploring relevant conduct and what that actually is. Relevant conduct is all acts and omissions committed by the individual, but in a simplistic term, relevant conduct is an action or inaction that has harmed or placed a child or vulnerable adult at risk of harm. So relevant conduct is conduct which endangers a child or adult or would, is likely to. If repeated against or in relation to a child or vulnerable adult would endanger or likely endanger the child or vulnerable adult. Relevant conduct is conduct which involves sexual material relating to children, including possession of such material. Relevant conduct is also uh, conduct which involves sexually explicit images depicting violence against human beings, including possession of such images. And relevant conduct is conduct which is of a sexual nature involving a child or vulnerable adult. Breaking that down a little further, a person's conduct endangers a child or adult if they harm a child or a vulnerable adult. This could be physically pushing a resident of a care home to the floor, cause a child or adult to be harmed. So this could be not supervising children during a school trip that then resulted in a child going missing. Put a child or adult at risk of harm this could be sleeping during a waking night shift, putting the adults at risk of harm. So no harm has to have been caused, but they were put at risk. Attempt to harm a child or vulnerable adult. This could be someone attempting to push a service user in anger. However, a colleague stopped them. And incite another to harm a child or adult. This could be a care assistant advising other staff to double pad residents, unlock their bedroom doors at night to reduce workload. Moving on to the harm test. Let's explore what that is. 
A person satisfies the harm test if they may harm a child or vulnerable adult or put them at risk of harm. It's something a person may do to cause harm or pose a risk of harm to a child or vulnerable adult. So when relevant conduct can't be established, but it does appear to DBS that a person may do any of the points as listed on this slide, the harm test is satisfied. Because not everything needs to be an action. Sometimes people express thoughts and feelings which if they acted upon, that would cause or put someone at risk of harm. For example, if someone disclosed to a colleague that they were having thoughts of a sexual nature about children in their care, this would be considered by DBS as a risk of potential future harm, even if they'd not acted on those thoughts and feelings at that time. We do get asked about um, abuse and harm and its definition. This is not actually defined in the legislation. DBS, we view harm as its common understanding or the definition you may find in a dictionary. Harm is considered in its widest context and it can include any of the categories of harm that you see here on this screen. Sexual harm, physical harm, financial harm, neglect, emotional harm, psychological harm and verbal harm. This is not a fully comprehensive list. We understand that harm can take many different forms. One of the misconceptions about DBS is that we can investigate situations and incidents and we can't. The DBS, we have no legal powers of investigation. We rely on information given to us by way of a referral and supporting documentation. Safeguarding is everybody's responsibility. If you don't raise a concern, who will? If you don't raise that concern, how will anyone know? If you don't raise a concern, the person may go on to cause further harm to a vulnerable person. If you do raise a concern and the relevant body or employer makes a referral to DBS, we will consider all of the evidence when deciding whether the person should be barred. And we will only bar a person from working with vulnerable groups if it's the right thing to do. We have tried to make our referral process and routes as easy as possible. There are three routes you can use to get in a referral and information to us. You can refer someone via our online portal, which is available on the DBS website. It takes around 45 minutes to complete. And the feedback that we've had is that has been, this has been a really simplistic and streamlined way to get that referral information to DBS. If that's not the best option for you, you can download our paper referral form and then either email that to us at those email addresses you can see on screen. Or you can download the paper referral form, fill it in and then post it to the address that you see here on screen. However, it's important to know that we can't guarantee the security of information until it's actually in our possession. So if you are sending anything via the postal service, please choose some form of special recorded delivery option. What does a good quality referral look like? Again, we have no legal powers of investigation here at DBS, so the quality of the referral and the depth and how informative it is, it really makes a significant difference. There is a balance for the need for a swift response with the need for sufficient documentary or supporting evidence. When you do or if you do fill a referral form in for DBS, please complete the referral form as comprehensively as possible. And if there are any gaps in information, let us know why that is. The detail of the sequence of events from initial notification to the final outcome is of very high value to us. As is relevant information, anything that will help DBS facilitate in our decision making process, again, is of high value. Please also make us aware of the impact of what happened on the victim. Please also include where appropriate training and supervision records 
and any other supporting internal or external investigative and disciplinary process documentation. So things like interviews, let us know if there's been a police intervention or multi-agency meetings and please include recruitment and additional employment information, especially if there has been any conversations previously or anything noted about previous misconduct or complaints about that person. To recap what it means to be placed on a barred list, if someone is placed on the children's barred list, they are not allowed to engage in regulated activity with children in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and that also applies to regulated work in Scotland. Exactly the same, if someone is placed on the adults barred list, they are not allowed to engage in regulated activity with vulnerable adults in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, and yes, that too also applies to regulated work in Scotland. It's a criminal offence to work, seek to work or offer to work. That includes volunteering in regulated activity when barred on the relevant list. And it's a criminal offence for a person to permit an individual they know or have reason to believe is barred from regulated activity to engage in regulated activity. There's a maximum penalty of five years imprisonment and or that £5,000 fine. If there is anything that DBS can offer, do or advise on, please let us know. There are our contact details. And if you would like to get in touch with me for any advice, information or guidance on anything DBS, please email dbsregionaloutreach at dbs.gov.uk. I am on hand, as are my other colleagues in regional outreach, to ask, answer any questions that you may have about DBS checks, including eligibility and regulated activity. We can offer support in making barring referrals and help you understand if a scenario you're dealing with actually falls under that legal duty to refer. We can also deliver some bespoke training and workshops directly to your organisations and support your own internal training programmes that require some DBS information within that. And we're always looking for feedback on anything and however we can improve DBS products and services. Thank you for watching this pre-recorded session and have a great rest of day ahead.